Don't, uh, first of all, could I uh, congratulate my noble friend Lord Cowan on the very excellent case which he put. And I don't proceed, uh, 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 proceed by repeating any of the arguments. Uh, but I have looked at these regulations, um, and uh, some people who've spoken in this debate clearly haven't. If you wanted to actually sabotage a product and add to the costs of producing that product and limit the scope for competition with that product uh, and drive out of business small producers, it is hard to see how a more effective job could be done in respect of the regulations that apply to electronic cigarettes. And as far as um, uh, the noble um, uh, lords uh, who uh, argued that this was all a plot by the tobacco companies are concerned, uh, one way of ensuring that all of this ends up in the hands of large businesses will be by pursuing exactly these regulations, uh, by limiting choice and, and, of course, by creating a black market which will be accessed through the internet, as we've seen uh, occur over and over again in respect of medicinal uh, products. Uh, there seems to be no logic uh, in the regulations. Uh, uh, we've already touched on the point as to why some advertising is allowed and not others. And, and I find it extraordinary that a government should want to ban advertising when the evidence which we've had from Ash, uh, the noble lord uh, referred to that, uh, says that perceptions of harm from electronic cigarettes have grown with only 15% of the public accurately believing in 2016 that electronic cigarettes are a lot less harmful than smoking. Now, if most people don't realise the benefits of it, what on earth is the logic of preventing people advertising it? And how does the noble lady, Baroness Walmsley, explain that she wants a public information campaign? How do you have a public information campaign without advertising the benefits of electronic cigarettes? And therefore, why is she against the advertising of electronic cigarettes? Uh, there is no logic in this. Now, um, I hope he doesn't mind me mentioning the fact, but my son is... I'll give way in a second, if I just make, finish the point. My son is 37 years old. He has smoked cigarettes since he was 16, to the best of my knowledge, probably earlier. Three Christmases ago, and he you know, uh, smoked very heavily. Three Christmases ago, I should declare an interest, I bought him an electronic cigarette. And as a result, he's reduced the levels of nicotine and all the things that we've tried. I've tried blackmail, I've tried bullying, I've tried nicotine patches, we've tried everything under the sun, and it's worked. And the figures show that a third of the 2.8 million adults who are vaping in this country are ex-smokers. So the arguments that have been put for the public health benefits are overwhelming. Now, it pains me to say this, but this is a classic example of gold plating of European regulations by the UK Health Department. It is. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the point is that because they've gold plated these regulations, there's actually nothing we can do about it because they're EU regulations and we're required to implement them. And I just wonder what on earth was going on in the Department of Health that made them do this. And when you see something absurd happening, ask, qui bono, who benefits from this? Well, certainly the government benefits from it because people who are continuing to smoke cigarettes will pay a very considerable amount in tax to the Exchequer. Those people who start vaping, instead of paying, I don't know how much, I've never smoked in my life, I don't know how much a packet of cigarettes costs, but I'm told it's about nine pounds. Nine pounds for 20 cigarettes. Vaping, you won't spend that in a week. And, and therefore, for those families on low incomes, and many of the people who smoke heavily are amongst the lowest income families, will actually benefit from something which enables them to deal with the addiction which they have to nicotine and be able to uh, remove from it. So who benefits from this? Certainly not those people who are amongst the poorest in our country who are smokers. The Exchequer benefits, the Treasury benefits, if people are still smoking cigarettes because they get the tax on those cigarettes, which is very considerable. And of course, the pharmaceutical companies benefit who sell the nicotine patches. And of course, the tobacco companies benefit uh, because people are not switching away. So what on earth is the government doing 
promoting the interests of the tobacco companies and the large pharmaceuticals, because that is the effect of this. And the regulations go, I mean, the detail is unbelievable. It even, spe it even spells out which typeface, Helvetica, whether it should be bold or italic, should appear on the warnings. I mean, this is, this is, this is North Korean stuff. This is, I mean, this is utterly absurd regulation. And we may laugh of it, but what it means, as the noble Lord Campbell Savers pointed out, what it means is that small businesses up and down the country will have to comply with these regulations, will have to work out what they mean, will have to change all their literature and everything else, and as a result, be driven out of business. Now, we're in a bit of a quandary here because, of course, um, there's much in these regulations which is actually quite desirable. And when we have left the European Union, we will be in a position where we can actually hold our ministers to account and actually hold votes and actually make these things happen. But I hadn't realised this very clever operation by the Department of Health. What you do is you have some absurd regulations which you know you're not going to get through the House of Commons. So what you do is you go to Brussels and you persuade them to include them in an EU directive and then hey-ho, they have to sail through both houses because there's nothing we can do about it. And we all take part in this pantomime where we explain all the reasons why they should be changed, knowing full well there's very little we can do about it until we leave the European Union. So I congratulate my noble friend on his efforts. And I do hope that the government will rethink when they are free to do so these absurd regulations, which will undoubtedly cost lives. They will undoubtedly cost lives. And they are a classic example of how big business is able to use Brussels, together with lobbying organisations, to the disadvantage, and indeed in this case, to the life-threatening disadvantage of the citizens of this country. Bring the house.